right, so I know it's uh, like the first day of school, and everyone's visiting and excited and chatting, but I guess we have to get down to work here. So uh, welcome everyone. I will call the committee to order. Um, this is the first meeting of the second half of the 2023-2024 biennium of the Senate Transportation Committee. Today is Wednesday, February 14th. Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. It is uh, about seven minutes after three o'clock and we are in room 1100 of the Minnesota Senate building. Um, and members, uh, it is, it is um, Valentine's Day, so we have some treats for you over at the staff table, some back here. You guys are not supposed to eat at the table. <laughs> maybe I'll close my eyes to that, maybe not, but help yourself to our treats. Or there, there are some bowls of, of yummy treats at the table here too, so take some and pass them along. Um, before we get going, I was gonna introduce uh, some new me a new member, but uh, I'll wait till she comes back. Um, we also have um, some new staff to, to introduce. Uh, 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 Vice Chair Morrison has a new LA, her name is Anna Giesting. And uh, our new member, who remains nameless for the moment, um, her legislative assistant is Jack Dudley. And then if our committee pages could step forward uh, so everyone can take a look at you and you can wave. Uh, we have Kylan Johnson and Will Olson. So they'll be helping us out uh, as we move through the remainder of the year. So welcome to Team Transpo. So I'll, I'll just give it up. Uh, Liz Bolden, State Senator Liz Bolden from Rochester has joined our committee. Uh, Senator Port has stepped off our committee. Um, and with that, uh, members, um, we're gonna just kind of ease into um, our committee and we'll start running bills next week. Um, and uh, today we're gonna have a presentation on um, the Department of uh, Driver and Vehicle Services reports on the independent expert recommendations. But before I do that, I thought I'd welcome um, our, our lead uh, from the Republican Party, uh, Senator Jasinski, to see if you have any welcoming comments or opening words on this fine uh, Valentine's you, Day. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I just want to say thanks to everybody for coming, and it's exciting to be back in the session, uh, and I plan on continuing our great relationship that we have with Senator Dibble across the aisle uh, to get things done. I think transportation is something that should really be nonpartisan, uh, get things done across Minnesota, and uh, make it easier for our residents to get across the state and get services provided. So uh, we've already met Senator Dibble and myself on some priorities I'd like to see done this year, and we're working together on several bills, so hopefully you'll see lots of bills with either me as the author or he as the author and me in the second position or vice versa, so I want to get some things done. So uh, thanks again and look forward to uh, getting lots of work done this session. And welcome, Senator Bolden. Great, Senator Bolden, welcome to the committee. Um, I introduced you when you are out of the room, but did you want to say hello and say anything you'd like to say about anything? <laughs> Apologies for stepping away, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I'm uh, very grateful to be joining the committee and I'm eager to uh, learn more and work on transportation. I, um, Liz Bolden, I represent District 25, which is uh, most of Rochester, um, Orinoco, and some areas north. Um, so very uh, grateful to be on the committee. Thank you. Great, welcome. So members, um, with that, uh, we'll turn our attention to the DVS report on the IER. And I'll just mention, this is one of a, of a number of these kinds of reports. I think uh, I counted up at one time with, um, uh, Senate Council's help here, um, like 35 things we sent out for more thought, more consideration, recommendation. We're not gonna hear 35 reports on everything, and some of them aren't due until next year or even later, um, but we do have a number of questions we ask the agencies to go work on and bring back to us, so this is the first of those. Um, and so with that, uh, we have Ms. Gallagher at the table, um, and if we want to invite forward uh, Peng Zhang, uh, from the Driver and Vehicle Services Director, and are you gonna be accompanied by Mr. Halt Alterheide? Uh, no. Oh, so, no, all right. He, he's kind of floating in the ether somewhere uh, monitoring our proceedings. Um, I think Commissioner Jacobson is or was here. He was here to say hello, so he's now gone. All right, welcome to the committee, uh, Director Zhang, um, and please proceed as you um, see fit and members why don't we just uh, go ahead and get through his his presentation and then we'll um, bring it back to the committee for questions all right welcome thank you mr. chair and good afternoon um, my name is Pong Zhang director of the driver and vehicle services division very happy to be back here and sharing with you all that our, our a summary of the report that we worked on 
Um, this is an, uh, an overview of the, the legislative report regarding the status of the recommendations of the, I, uh, the independent expert review and the report of the Office of the Legislative Auditor and also an exam station plan. Uh, my presentation today will walk through the status of the recommendations from the IAR and the OLA and highlight the analysis behind the exam station plan outlined in this report. So as you know, Rick King and his team prepared a 2022 report titled Independent Expert Review and presented it to the legislature. That report contains several recommendations for DVS to improve operations and service delivery to Minnesotans. DVS has implemented the recommendations of the IAR. Today I will provide an overview of those recommendations and how they have been incorporated to work, uh, into our work at DVS. So uh, the, the first recommendation here is, uh, was for our, um, DV, DVS to review the DR and the DLA contracts, that's Deputy Registrar and Driver's License Agents contracts, um, uh, for incentives to become full service providers. We did do a careful review of those agreements and determined that there weren't any provisions with that that hindered the agents from uh, providing either motor vehicle or driver's license application uh, services. Uh, this next uh, recommendation was for, the, uh, for DVS to use data and reporting practices to assist in making decisions focused on residents of the state. Uh, with the implementation of MinDrive, DVS has vastly expanded our ability to access, access and track data and regularly use that data to inform decisions about staffing, appointments, and other key services. Uh, the IER also directed us to do a, a staffing review um, and we have done that. We have leveraged uh, diff several different technologies, including MidDrive, um, to establish uh, performance standards and targets that meet the, the needs of the state. Uh, we've taken a dynamic approach to staffing, utiliza staffing, utilizing data to best allocate resources and ensure a staffing model that meets the needs of our customers. And then lastly, on this slide, um, the IER recommended that DVS create performance metrics for DRs and DLAs. Uh, we are working with our partners um, using reporting from MinDrive. Um, we, have, we have established, established reports such as those that um, identify error rates that both us and our partners can have access to. And then we continue to look for different opportunities for us to expand MinDrive sharing and create more transparency in that work. Another recommendation was to create a rapid response communication for immediate support. Um, you know, DVS has, uh, uh, to achieve this, DVS utilizes a dedicated phone line for DRs and DLAs and has created a rapid response process for issues identified in our system. Um, and we work regularly with our partners to, to um, identify opportunities to improve any, any um, um, communication in that space. Uh, the, the, recommend, the IER also recommended um, acceleration of background checks. A DVS has dedicated weekly appointments at BCA for new employees to obtain fingerprints and has created a limited access profile for new employees um, uh, with our DLAs uh, to begin work in MinDrive uh, processing the standard credential as they work on getting their real ID background. Um, and that's again, that's been a, was a great partnership with from our DR and DLA partners, um, introducing or identifying that as a need, and and DVS working with our partners to implement that change. Um, the IR recommended uh, the promotion of or the requirement of a review of the a requirement of requiring a pre-application, and after reviewing, uh, DVS has determined that. Uh, a requirement for pre-application isn't necessary. The application is available for those who have access to it, and requiring the access may actually create some challenges for, for a subset of our customers. Um, we do try to improve the pre-application and make it as convenient as possible. The IER also recommended um, that DVS adjust policies and practices to automate as many approval transactions as possible. Um, we have done, we have implemented several uh, transactions where we've created automation. We continue to identify more and, and that requires both work on the front end and, and on the back end. Um, um, but there are, we are excited about those continued opportunities to improve uh, services in the back office. Uh, the IER also recommended that DVS explore additional differentiated user levels in MinDrive. We've um, 
uh, to accomplish this, DVS has created a standard uh, user profile in MinDrive for individuals who have been hired and can't pr quite yet process Real-ID compliant credentials. We've also explored several different um, uh, um, ideas with our DR and DLA partners on different user levels, and we will continue to explore that as we identify different roles in the system. Right. Uh, the IER also recommended that we include deputy registrars in our MinDrive enhancement process, and uh, our DR and DLA partners are active uh, members and participants of our uh, change process. Um, SQRs are, are, are prioritized regularly, and, and our deputy registrar and driver's license agents partners actually have several priority uh, slots that they manage and, and present to the department for, for prioritization. The IR recommended that DVS provide additional training and clear um, guidance regarding permissible use of records. In December of 2021, DVS implemented the ability for MinDrive users to add a notation to a record while viewing the record. Uh, this feature allows users to provide an explanation for their access of the data and created a system to prevent individuals from looking up their own data in the system. In addition, DVS has ongoing training regarding data uses and sends regular reminders to MinDrive users regarding data access standards. Um, the IR, uh, in reviewing what security measures are appropriate for at each DR or DLA location, DV, DVS created a security team that provides a regular review of potential security concerns and provides recommendations. DVS has also created uh, materials for offices to post regarding expectations for customer behavior within each office. Uh, just also as a note from last session, we are very thankful for uh, the change that, that also includes um, uh, protecting our customers and our DLA, DR and DLA partners from, from um, uh, inappropriate behavior. Um, the IR also recommended for us to for DVS to offer de-escalation training and negotiation techniques uh, for our public-facing staff. Uh, DVS, we make uh, de-escalation materials available to all of our deputy registrars and driver's license agents on shared devices that can be accessed at any time. Uh, next, I'll cover some of the, OLA, uh, the OLA recommendations. So first, I want to draw your attention to page 11 of the report, where we made a revision to an error. Um, in the first version of this, of this report you received, it stated that DVS would need 95 additional examiners. Uh, that was a typo. Um, the number has been corrected. Uh, you should have the corrected version, which now accurately states that DVS would need 15 to 20 additional examiners in our, uh, for focused on Class D exams to meet the, the current demand in the, the proposed um, reduce, reduce exam station plan. Uh, the OLA recommended that DVS strive to meet the 14-day requirement and statute for Class D appointments. DVS has standardized appointments availability across the exam station and is using data in MinDrive to account for demand and staffing needs to improve efficiencies and offer as many appointments as possible. However, the demand for appointments continues to outpace DVS resources and additional examiners are needed to achieve the 14-day requirement statewide. Um, we are meeting that demand in, in areas of greater Minnesota, and, um, um, and, and actually as of noon today, we have uh, five of the ten regions are, have appointments available. Um, the demand in the metro continues to exceed our resources in the metro, and, uh, and that's where um, um, we actually don't have any availability as, as of today. Uh, the OLA has recommended that DVS uh, uh, develop a robust method to regularly forecast demand for Class D road tests, and DVS has accomplished this with both MinDrive and working with uh, external partners like the uh, uh, demographer's office. Uh, we can see the number of individuals eligible for road tests uh, and where they live. We can also track whether someone travels to obtain their road tests. Uh, DVS has also greatly reduced the, the use of staff overtime by standardizing appointment availability and the use of overtime, and the current staffing model is minimal. In January of 2022, DVS completed the reopening of the exam stations that closed in 2020. Um, in the original report and two updates, the OLA has called out the need to reduce the number of exam uh, locations. In March of 2021, the OLA completed a review of DVS exam stations and made several recommendations. 
It has since issued two updates on the report and its recommendations. So in arriving at 46 exam stations, uh, we took several factors into account. Uh, first, we consider the OLA recommended less than 93 stations and the IER re recommended somewhere between 40 and 50 stations. We also consider that the amount of time our examiners currently spend traveling to some of our exam stations that are only open a few times a month reduces the number of exams that DVS is able to provide. This model will leave all current hub stations open, um, reducing the need to move or obtain new leases, but still ensuring an exam would be available within the customer's county or residence um, or adjacent county. DV DVS also consider where the highest demand for exams currently exists, and this model seeks to provide better geographic population center balance. Currently, approximately 60% of, of the demand is within the Twin Cities metro area. Um, and then on this next slide here, um, we use both current data showing demand and compared to recent trends to determine the exam station locations and staffing re requirements to offer enough appointments to meet demand. Um, at the bottom of this report, you'll see at the bottom right, um, we, uh, we work with the demographer to and MinDrive data to estimate the demand for 2024. At the top of the slide here, you'll see that the, uh, the month of January compared year over year, we're starting the year off strong and exceeding our pace from last year. Um, and that's through the hard work of individuals, including our training team who are quickly or working diligently to quickly get our new examiners ready. In 2023, with 112 examiners and 93 exam stations, uh, we conducted uh, over 143,000 Class D exams. Um, over 13,000 CDL exams, over 217,000 uh, Class D knowledge tests, and over 90,000 uh, CDL knowledge, ex knowledge exams. Uh, demand for Class D skills exams are, are projected to be um, uh, roughly between 215 to 237,000 throughout the state. Under the 46 exam station model, DVS would expect to conduct approximately 8,000 more Class D skills exams on, based on the efficiency gained with less travel time. Thanks. We recognize that this plan will require some Minnesotans uh, to drive further to take an exam that they might need today. Um, one of the things that we worked very hard on, on this, with this plan was to ensure that the average tra travel time for any resident or, um, is, uh, wasn't anything more than 32 miles. Um, a reduction of exam stations would improve efficiencies and allow DVS to better serve all Minnesotans, and DVS uh, wants to provide services in the best way possible. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to present this information and, uh, to the committee, and I'll stand for questions. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, uh, Director Zhang. Um, I have the first question. Um, so I, you know, I, I, this conversation about reducing the number ex of exam stations has been around for uh, a while. Um, uh, my basic question is, um, I heard you say um, additional resources. You talk about additional staffing. Um, even if we were to reduce um, to, to 46 exam stations. Um, uh, when you say uh, additional resources, um, what, what are you referring to? Um, additional resources from the resources that we've already increased in the last budget cycle um, for the purposes of the services you provide. If you recall, we've increased a, a number of transaction fees. Um, and uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not guessing there's going to be uh, any appetite to do any more of that in the near or distant future. Um, uh, and I uh, certainly don't think we're going to be providing any resources out of the Trunk Highway Fund or the General Fund. So are you developing a plan for use of resources that are are anticipated from those increases um, and, and redeploying those resources in light of the reduction uh, and the more efficiencies you'd gain from this plan that you're proposing. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, yes, the the request for or the identification of resources to meet the 14-day demand is is an increase is a request for or an identification of a need to increase the op appropriation to DBS so that we can hire the additional staffing needed to to uh, provide exams um, uh, th both throughout Greater Minnesota and in the Metro. Uh, we do appreciate all the all the diff the different um, increases to the operating accounts that were that were um, included in last year's session, and I, I do think that those that those changes make uh, have made this potential uh, possible. So, uh, when you say appropriation, appropriation from the special revenue funds for this purpose, or an appropriation from the general fund. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, appropriation from the Special Revenue Fund to DVS, we, uh, the, the operating account now has the, the revenue necessary to support that uh, increased appropriation to DVS should we choose to uh, uh, resource the, the examiners. Okay. Thank you. I like that. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and Director Jong. You know, my concern is we're still in a crisis here in Minnesota. Uh, we continually hear about waiting hours or having to drive hours and wait days and days to get these things done. Uh, we've been trying to correct it. We funded more. Um, you know, the big, big thing we hear these days is inflation, inflation. Well, we're shifting the cost from the departments to the residents because they're going to have to drive farther. Uh, Low-income families are having to drive farther and farther, and many, many of them can't do that. And people that are middle income, they can afford to drive two hours, take the day off, and do those things. But there's lots of low-income families that just simply can't afford to take a day off to get their child to get there. You know, we've proposed uh, third-party CDLs that should alleviate some of these things so we can do this faster. Uh, those have been turned down. Uh, we, we have to get this under control. You talk about de-escalating training. Well, we have to do escalating training because people are so frustrated with the system and what's going on. And, and I don't see it getting any better. We're, we're closing stations. Our backlogs are, are still beyond the 14 days by law. Um, I, I'm just frustrated. We, we, we're putting money at this and we're not seeing results. And again, this big discussion of inflation, well, we're pushing the costs on to more consumers. So yet, ever, the prices of everything is going up, no matter this or, or other issues. It's, it's inflation by regulation is what's happening. And uh, our citizens across the state of Minnesota are, are experiencing more and more costs. And, and we gave you more money to keep more stations open and you took the money and we're closing stations. Um, it's frustrating and I hear about it a lot in my district of people having to drive two and three hours. Uh, other comments, uh, people have to get up at midnight at, and 12.01 to get online to try and get this reservation and they go like that. Uh, Something needs to be fixed, and, and we need to do it, and I appreciate the report. Uh, I don't think everything that they asked for is, is in the report. I mean, there's things, lots of things that aren't talked about. So I'll follow up with some other ones in detail. I don't want to take too much of the committee, but we have a lot of work to do, and, and it's not being corrected. So I appreciate everything trying to be done, and but we're still in a crisis here, and, and we need to fix that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Jasinski. Director Zhang, did you want to respond? Yeah, Mr. Chair, Senator Jasinski, uh, thank you for those comments. And uh, I, I would just like to point out that this uh, is a potential plan if we were to reduce. Uh, that was what was requested of the report was to identify a proposed plan if we were to reduce uh, exam stations. DVS is not actively planning to reduce or close any of our exam stations. Uh, we recognize that if we were if we were to embark on that journey, there's a lot of work and a lot of communication, a lot of stakeholders that need to be involved in that uh, before we before we even consider um, closing an exam station. Thank you. Thank you, members. Anything further? Questions? Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, you know, I notice on here there's a there's a You've got it listed as, as as an exam station, Hastings slash Woodbury or Woodbury slash Hastings. Those two communities are quite a ways apart. Is there, why are they listed together? There's a community of Cottage Grove in between there. Why would you list them together? Is there a is is there a, two satellites at each one, and now you combine them to one, and so there's none in Woodbury, which is to me, the larger of the two? Director Jean. 
Mr. Chair, Senator Howell, thank you uh, for that question. Yes, we identified the Woodbury area as a, as a potential opportunity to, to put an exam station where we have a larger population of, of, of uh, Minnesotans in that metro area. Currently, Stillwater is one of our um, hub locate or not, sorry, hub satellite locations that we visit on a, on a weekly basis. Um, but it's not open uh, five days a week, and so there's uh, that was identified as a potential opportunity for us to to create to have some flexibility in that space. Should we should we find availability for um, uh, real estate? Uh, on that note, I, I just one of the things that we are quickly learning is that the real estate market is is not quite as available as as we would like it to be, and and. Um, um, you know, finding real estate and, and the type of real estate that we need to conduct exams has been, is, is quite a challenge. Follow up? Mr. Chair, I just, when I look at those, uh, when I look at the, the sites that are being closed or, or proposed to be closed and, uh, you know, what is the process here? How, what's, what is the timeline from going from now until closure? I mean, if these are proposed, when is that going to be enacted or has it already happened? Director John. Mr. Chair, Senator Howe, uh, there are no active plans to close any exam station. Uh, we haven't began any process to, to even consider closing an exam station. This analysis was strictly as a, as a hypothetical as requested by the report. Uh, Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so I noticed that in the, you know, in the report there was a, a number of, of concerns and, and stuff, but I, I don't see it d d addressed in your condensed report or summary. Uh, was there a reason not all of the recommendations were looked at? Or is it were they looked at and not just reported? Director Jean. Mr. Chair, Sarah Nahau, uh, there, there are several other recommendations that were not called out by the, by the reports, the, the language for requiring the report. There are other recommendations from um, the IER and, and from the IER report, sorry, the OLA and the IER report. Um, all, of, all of the recommendations are, have been taken into consideration. We've implemented those that are already available to us. We have identified ones that we, that we just simply cannot. And then we continue to work on, on other items. Um, if, there are if there's a specific recommendation, I'm happy to, to share what DVS has done. Senator Howell. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so if, if you could kind of, is there, could you show those to us or lay those out to us exactly which ones you haven't done and which ones you absolutely decided that is against and I'm, I'm and why you wouldn't take one that's a recommendation and and you absolutely won't do I'd, I'm curious to find out what what that would be director Zhang. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Senator Howell, um, we're, we're happy to walk through the IER uh, report or, and or the OLA report if, if that is a desire for this committee. Um, I'm not prepared to walk through it at this very moment. I, I, will, I will acknowledge that, or I'd like to note that a lot of the recommendations from the report actually were implemented last session as part of, of um, um, changes that came through this body. Senator Howell, we'll, uh, we'll work on that and get some information about the, the totality of the IAR report and the many, many recommendations that were in there and what we had asked through legislative initiative for them to respond to last year, which was scaled back from Senator Newman had wanted, to, he wanted to hear about everything. Um, we scaled that back, um, but we'll take a fresh look at it and see if that makes sense or still makes sense to take a look at all those other items that you're asking about. And we'll get back to you, thanks. Senator Carlson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, Commissioner, I have this, kind of the same question uh, with regard to the uh, automobile inspection stations, and this is to uh, to change the uh, um, let's say the the impaired titles. Uh, I've had a couple of people that have said that they can't get a uh, an appointment for inspections, and I'm hoping that you uh, would take a look at that as well. Yeah, Senator Zhang, I've been hearing about that problem too. So if you could respond to that, thank you. 
uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Carlson, thank you for, for that question. Yes, uh, VIN inspections are certainly uh, a demand, another demand that DVS is really uh, struggling to meet. Uh, we are uh, we did think we are very appreciative of the funding and the resources that were that were appropriated from this uh, from last session, that uh, increases both the number of sites that DVS can open and uh, and staffing. We have hired staffing um, um, and we are are looking we are continuing to work with uh, admin and commercial real estate partners to find locations where we can do um, VIN inspections. Um, I don't have a, a, the exact update in front of me right now. I'm happy to, to come back and share that information. Uh, but it has been a, a very uh, difficult process to, to secure real estate because of the, the demands that of, of an inspection site and of the requirements that the state needs uh, to be a lessee uh, at a property. We are look, working with admin on a regular basis daily uh, to identify opportunities and move as many leases forward as we can. Um, thank you, um, Director Zhang. We will uh, we'll take you up on that because um, yeah, it's, uh, you know we hear we hear about all these things. This is this is our stock and trade. Uh, we hear about and and your agency, as you know, is the, one of the most front facing uh, with the with the most direct public interface of any. So. We're often on the phone with you, trying to solve people's problems. I have uh, Senator Drzinski, then Senator Howe. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just to follow up on Senator Carlson's, and, and I've heard the same issue, I think we probably all have. Uh, is it accurate to say some people are waiting over a year to have this happen on an inspection on a vehicle? I, I've heard stories that one and, and some up to two years to wait to get a vehicle inspected. And then a second question going up to your real estate issues, and I think it's happening in Fairville where DVS is actually leasing space in an existing auto, par auto body shop where they have someone come down for one day a week or something like that. And I I'm assuming there's plenty of places around Minnesota that have an operational facility already there. Uh, you guys bring your inspector in for one day or two days a week, depending on the territory, uh, to get that done without having to acquire real estate, without having to do all those things. I'm sure there's plenty of auto body shops that would have space available to do that. I know it's done in Faribault, so I mean, if you could follow up on that. And then the one to two years on, a, uh, on getting a, a, a title taken care of on these type of vehicles, how can that be? Director Jean. Mr. Chair, Senator Jasinski. Uh, so the customer has an opportunity to schedule an appointment 30, uh, up to 30 days, um, and that's our, our 30 day window for appointments uh, are across the board for both VIN inspections, also um, uh, exam appointments uh, for either drive, or for either the road test or the skills test. It's a 30 day window for appointments. Now, customers may choose to, uh, they may not be ready to have an inspection. There's lots of reasons where, where they, uh, they might not um, uh, set up an appointment or request an appointment. Uh, to my knowledge, I'm not aware of any one, any specific customer, I'm happy to look into it. I'm not aware of any specific customer that's been waiting um, years for an appointment. Um, but I'm happy, I'm, I'm happy to look into it and I, I recognize that there is a larger demand for um, uh, VIN inspections than, than there are appointments available. And, and it, there is very likely that, that someone is waiting for an appointment. To your uh, comment about uh, uh, borrowing or using uh, existing um, um, shops and, and their lifts, we are, that is one of our creative solutions that we've implemented by uh, after hiring more staff is, is working with our, our dealership community specifically and, um, and doing uh, uh, VIN inspections on site, uh, working with lo those local uh, dealers to that office and seeing if they're willing to let us uh, let that office um, host some inspections. Um, our, our we try to work very closely with our dealership community who turns a lot of these uh, salvage vehicles around for sale um, and require VIN inspections. Uh, one of the challenges is, is getting, um, is setting up appointments for um, kind of your lay customer, your, your general customer, that's not a dealership um, at one of these dealership sites. And, and that's why it's so important that, we, that DVS works on getting, um, a securing a lease so that we can also conduct um, private customer uh, transactions as well. And, and then one follow last follow-up, and I'll shut up and I'll let the rest of the, the committee members talk. Uh, uh, switching back to the driver's license, uh, you know, last year, uh, we, uh, or the, the legislature approved uh, license for undocumented immigrants. And, 
And I, I've seen a lot of influx of that. I think Minneapolis Public Schools, I heard 2,500 new students of non-speaking. So are you tracking the amount of undocumented immigrants that are coming in that, that are, is that increasing? Or are you tracking the number of people that are doing that? And is that backing things up, making things worse? Or uh, can you just comment on, on that population of, of the people there? Because I think we were concerned about that because we had heard prior to last year, prior to that bill being passed about undocumented immigrants, of we already backlogged. And with that happening, what would happen? So I guess I'd like to see uh, what's happening with that since since that was approved. Thank you, and that's my last question. Director Zhang. Mr. Chair, Senator Jasinski, uh, by design, we are not tracking undocumented uh, credentials or applications for credentials. Um, that uh, as part of that legislation, there was protections for DVS to specifically not track. And so while we don't know exactly how many new credentials in the system are, are from um, um, the deal for all uh, legislation, we are seeing an increase in, in the utilization of our, of our standard credential. Senator Howe. Well, th thank you, Mr. Chair and, and uh, uh, Director Zhang. I've, I've got, if you want to, I can uh, provide you the name of the person that's been waiting since 2021 to get that, uh, to get that inspection. And I had another one that was over six months out and he, he had the wherewithal and the thought process to call me and I called your office, your, uh, the DVS and by gosh, uh, the next week he had an appointment and I'm just saying it shouldn't take that. They shouldn't take the, the, uh, our citizens to call me to make that happen. So, it, but with that, you know, we talked about the delay. If we implement the, the reduced and areas that are out there in the, uh, and went with the plan to re consolidate the exam stations. And with the ex additional funding for those examiners that we have, that I, what is it, out to 95 examiners that I think we currently have, is that gonna get us within the 14 days that we, uh, that is currently re required in state statute? And, and I got a follow up after that, thank you. Okay. Director Trump. Mr. Chair, Senator Howell, um, our analysis for the 46 uh, exam station plan that as proposed in this in this report um, would require an additional 20 to 25 examiners uh, to meet the 14 day demand uh, 14 day goal for or 14 day requirement per statute. Uh, DVS conducted in this last calendar year 143,000 uh, class D skills tests with our current complement. Uh, with the additional complement, we think we can meet the additional demand, which is between 215 and 237,000 total exams. And so that gap, by reducing, uh, by reducing the number of exam stations and also increasing the number of examiners, we think we'll be able to close the gap uh, of that demand to with our current uh, offerings. Director Zhang, I um, thought it was 15 to 20. Sorry, thank you. 15 to 20. Which is correct. Mr. Chair, correct, sorry. Uh, 15 to 20 additional examiners. Thank you. Thank you. Senator Howe. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'd, one, I'd like to know what time frame that catch up would be if that, if you get to 20 or 15 or whatever it would be and immediately you'd be able to pr catch up on that backlog. But the other thing I think that adds to that backlog is the, you can only get an, a, an appointment within 30 days. Why can't they go out? What What is the thought process behind 30 days for all of your appointments? Why can't they go out six months? Why can't they go out three months or, you know, 90 days to set that appointment? Director Zhang. Mr. Chair, Senator Howe, uh, thank you for that question. The uh, the move to 30 days has actually increased the number of appointments that we've been able to offer and actually get taken. Our, um, with, with our six month appointment, uh, we saw a significant number of cancellations, proportion of cancellations. And what that does to the system is it obviously we recycle those appointments back into the system, but then um, those who have been waiting or were, were waiting because there weren't any appointment, appointments for six months and um, um, 
if someone were to be looking at the right time, they might not have waited very long at all, and now there's an appointment available for them. It creates some inconsistency and inequity in that in appointment scheduling process. Um, so reducing the third day increases the number of actually filled appointments significantly. Uh, the, other, the other item is that uh, with 30-day appointments, we're able to more accurately predict and hold our appointments. Um, as, you, as any other industry that's ha that has front-facing customers, we experience a lot of uh, turnover. And um, when we set appointments out six months ahead, uh, that employee may may not be there anymore, and, and now we have an appointment that we we potentially have to cancel because we don't have the body there to to hold that appointment. And so, because of that, we actually um, are uh, in our six when we were still offering six month appointments, we offered a, a reduced number of appointments in the out months. But then, as we got closer in that thirty day window, we would offer more because we knew we had a better idea of what what our complement was at that at that time. By offering 30, at 30 days at a time, we consistently offer the maximum number of appointments that we think w that we can host, and we have contingencies like our supervisors and our lead workers step in and take appointments even if they're not on the schedule. If someone were to call in or had to leave unexpectedly, um, we we strive to not have to to not cancel any appointment uh, unnecessarily. Um, and then I'll just the last note on that is um, we uh, we are in the. We were in the minority of other, in, in comparison to other states, by offering six-month appointments. Uh, the majority of all jurisdictions offer something um, in this range, and several offer less, uh, windows even smaller than this, and for all the same reasons that uh, they see better show, uh, increase or yeah, improved um, attendance and also um, uh, better uh, schedule management. Dr. Zhang, where did the 93 stations or the 93 sites come from originally? How long has that been around? Whose idea was it? Was it a legislative thing that was imposed upon you? Or was it, who thought that was a good idea? <laughs> Mr. Chair, I, I, that certainly preceded uh, my time here at DVS. And um, I'm sure there's, there's, a lot, there's a long history with how those 93 exam stations were selected. I'm happy to do some research. I'm not sure how we. Well, how we identify I don't know that. if it's that important. I mean, it might. I mean, if it's not hard, I, I would be curious. Um, but it's one of those things where there it is, and to, to take it back now um, is hard. You know, I mean, politically very, very difficult um, to do um, because you know the paradox is as you're presenting, it would provide better and more timely. Um, fulfillment of these requests and this demand for skills test examinations, um, but it would force people into some level of inconvenience, forcing them to drive further than they, than they have to now. I mean, so it's a trade-off, wait or drive a little further. Um, and so um, it's just uh, politically difficult uh, to accomplish. So um, I would just say that if we're gonna go down this path, we would need the leadership of the executive branch and the chief executive to help us clear the way um, to go out and, and market and sell this as a good idea for Minnesotans, because um, otherwise it's a pipe dream, because um, you're asking legislators to go out uh, and endorse this idea that's coming from the bureaucracy and take all the downside risk politically for it. So, um, so someone's got to help us. If you really believe this is a good idea, you got to go out and help us sell it. So outside of a room like this, out where people are hearing and listening and, you know, got to engage community leaders, mayors, county commissioners, business leaders, the public at large, um, et cetera, because it's not going to happen by magic legislatively here until we know that we're standing on some better political ground. All right. Uh, anything further, members? Senator Zinsky. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I guess... We've, we've had frustration here in Minnesota, and I kind of Googled, and I was just looking at Googling, you know, frustration with getting driver's license. And everything on Google pops up Minnesota. Minnesota, Minnesota, Minnesota. Are there other states that have these difficulties, or is it just Minnesota? Because if you look at Google, the only things that show up is Minnesota when you put in frustrating getting driver's license. So can we explain why? Why would Minnesota be different than, other than 49 other states where we're having all these issues and other states aren't? Director Zhang. 
Mr. Chair, Senator Jasinski, um, I, I am aware of other states who are, are who are also struggling to meet the demand for um, for the exams or services they offer in general. Um, I can't speak for every state on on um, uh, and address their the reasons why they potentially are in that situation. Um, but I can assure you, Minnesota is not alone in in um, struggling to meet the demand for for their customers. As far as the the Google search. Um, there might be some regionality to how Google does their their uh, search res presents their search results, um, um, but again, I we work regularly with our other jurisdictions and and our my colleagues in those spaces, and and we they share similar concerns that we're that we're seeing here in Minnesota. Um, I, I think I think Senator Jasinski asks a good question. It would be important for us to know baseline how we compare to other states, um, you know, and uh, um, you know, and if we are an outlier in failing to respond to a basic service need uh, and a basic service that we provide as a state, um, we should know that. Um, how do we compare? And um, if, in fact, there are um, models from other states, you know, maybe models from other states support your plan of 46 stations asking people to go to some level of inconvenience in terms of getting to those, but having greater convenience in terms of how much time they have to wait and, and the reliability of, of scheduling. Um, it, it's, that's important data for us to have. So I think it's, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, anything, a follow up? Okay, Senator Lang. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, I guess as I, I'm sitting here, this is the second year we've gone through these fairly similar discussions where I think everybody sitting behind the table is kind of concerned about the same things. Us that live in outstate Minnesota are probably a little more affected by it. Um, but it, it, it's really feeling kind of the same as a, another uh, state system that, that we all kind of came together with and maybe, you know, should remain nameless minute, but uh, uh, when we went through the Minlars debacle. but. Uh, we all kind of came together, and I just I don't want to see this going down that same route. Um, it's concerning to me that you know there's some some pretty soft numbers when it comes to you know we don't have a plan to eliminate stations, but if we did, it would look a lot like this in our hands right here. Uh, and there's a lot of big numbers that are within our own districts, uh, where you know within a lot closer than the 32 miles that you were talking about earlier that I'm going to have people that don't have an ability to go get a a driver's license exam. And you know, I have a, I have a kid that's gonna be coming up real quick on that, so I'm gonna get this up close and personal whether it works or not. But truthfully, I just don't want it to go down that route. I don't want Senator Dibble and Senator Jasinski as leads on this committee having to go and talk to the governor and say, maybe we should look for a third party that can do this the right way. And that's a hard charge for your agency, and that's not anything to joke about, and it's a growing frustration. I don't think it's gotten any better over the last couple of years. So. Um, I don't know, I guess I, everything I can say is just remain, stay tuned, right? Keep paying attention to what's going on for us. And, um, you know, I look at this and I'm wondering what the heck were they using for criteria? I mean, is, is 600, is that, you know, three, four a day, is that not enough to keep a station open? Um, there's one on here that has almost 1,500. That's a lot of exams that you're shuffling on another station that may be a long ways away, and then you look at northern Minnesota, and there's a lot of gray state property that is not uh, does not have any station at all. And I, I know that there's people that live in those gray areas, so it's a little concerning looking at the the, the non-proposal proposal. But uh, um, yeah, as we go forward, we're going to have to pay close attention to this, and I think people have been pretty vocal about it in the past. And uh, I guess, Mr. Chair, that's on us. I'll uh, assure you, Senator Lang, it's a giant problem in the metro. The uh, station in Senator Carlson's district is jam-packed, and so my constituents are sometimes driving out, way far out of the metro to your exam station, so, to, and then the problem just kind of balloons from there. So, uh, Senator, or Director Zhang, I don't know if you wanted to respond to Senator Lang. Mr. Chair, Senator Lang, I, I just wanted to, I, I pre, Thank you for your comments and, and assure you that this was no uh, uh, easy task for us to identify what a proposed plan could look like. I mean, these are real people in, in real parts of Minnesota and certainly part of, of one Minnesota. 
Um, when, when we identified these stations, we, we tried to straight, stay true to the objective view of this. And, and one of our, one of, again, those tenants where we wanted to look at uh, the, the, those economic hubs in those areas um, to keep the, a reasonable number of exam stations as recommended by the IAR and the OLA um, to, to try to find a, 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 a solution, an analysis that, that fit that, that description. Um, but certainly, we know that if, if this were if we were to actually uh, do this work, that we need to engage with stakeholders. And as already mentioned here several times, um, um, if that time comes, we we would definitely we would plan to do that. All right. Um, our committee administrator said she drove to Mankato to take her test. <laughs> so we're just the metros creating problems for everyone all over the state. <laughs> What's new? All right, uh, Senator Howe. Thank you, Mr. Chair and uh, Mr. Zhang. The IR report recommended, you know, maybe shifting some stuff to the deputy registers in order to, and, and said you should reevaluate your role in, driver serv in the driver services ecosystem in order to try to determine how to best provide the most efficient service to our citizens. So the question I have is, and you know, and that's what we're all about, is trying to do the best thing to the people that, are, that need us, right? Our customer base, our taxpayers, and our constituents. My question is, did you do that reevaluation? And if so, what did you find out? And if not, why not? Director Zhang. Mr. Chair, Senator Hall, um, if you Point me to that, uh, the recommendation, if you could rephrase the recommendation, I'm not sure if I have the reference to which recommendation you're referring to. Well, it talked about shifting the costs, some costs to the deputy registers and then reevaluating how you, what services and what role you play in the driver services ecosystem. And that's the question I think is, is out there is, is maybe your role should change within the driver vehicle services and you need to re, did you reevaluate that? Did you even look at it? That's the question. Director Zhang. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, Senator Howe, I, I don't think that was one of the recommendations that was um, identified as part of this report. I am happy to follow up with you on, on that item and, and share more about it, specifics on how DVS addressed that recommendation. Senator Howe, is this, is this the, the ongoing co uh, question and conversation about the additional effort and expense that the, the DRs are put to? Oh, it's, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll hold the moment. Well, it would, it would be on page 28. Oh, of the, uh, of the original reports, yeah, so we'll have to. And then, yeah, page 28, 29, really, it's probably number not 14. We don't, we don't, we don't necessarily have, we don't have the, the report in front of us, you do. So, right, but um, that's where but, but you do, so yes. if you can help us understand. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair and Director Jean. Mr. Chair and uh, Senator Howe. Um, yes, the recommendation was DVS should conduct a staffing review that balances staff quality and, and uh, quantity and quality, leverages technology, automations, and configurations, and establishes performance standards and targets that meet the needs of Minnesotans. And yes, we certainly have. Uh, DVS has done that, and we continue to do that. Uh, that is an ongoing effort. Uh, MinDrive not only gives us uh, better tracking for actual production, um, these are transactions that are coming through both from our partners and from our, our, our offices, um, but additionally, DVS has invested in um, resources and technology that helps track the time we invest into these resources, and using that, both the time we spend doing certain activities and also tracking the activities themselves, we've created uh, several different models, and we've um, in, in fact, focused on exam stations as a priority uh, for that analysis. Um, part of what we're seeing in improved exam offerings is, is a result of that. 
Um, we have been able to standardize exam appointment offerings, uh, specifically driver class D exam offerings, so that all of our offices are, are consistently meeting the same uh, standards and service levels, and so that uh, the, uh, that experiences across the state are, are similar. And um, I do believe that as part of the, this recommendation, but just in general, our review of, of DVS work that, that had those improvements, we are seeing them as we are looking at the improved results year over year, even with, with similar resources. Senator Howell. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, and you know, Director, I, I, I think we should evaluate some, maybe take a look at who can, maybe it's best to maybe be an oversight over someone else that provides the service, and I don't know if you've taken that evaluation or not. But you know, I, I know that there's a, you've got a, a dashboard out there that the public can look at as far as tests and stuff. Do you also have an internal dashboard, and, and could we, as a committee, maybe get the last, kind of a screenshot of the latest internal uh, dashboard? Director Jean. Mr. Chair, Senator Howe, we, we do have reporting, uh, several reporting. Um, um, we have something that we do call a dashboard, and we're happy to share that. Um, it has a, a little bit different information for internal use, but I, there's nothing on there that we, that we wouldn't be able to share. Yeah, I would echo that would be um, interesting and useful for the entire committee. Thank you. All right. Senator Jasinski. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And just following up a little bit, I have the, the dashboard as well. And it, it says the number of driver's licenses were printed in the last two weeks and the number of titles, but it doesn't show any backlog. It doesn't show, it just kind of shows what's been done. Uh, it, so it doesn't really show the picture of what we're looking at in relation to what the backlog is. And I think the backlog is probably the most important dashboard to us as legislators to see what is the backlog. So that, that's the one thing. And then just also, as we brought this up today, and, and we obviously know we have an issue, uh, once again, you're going to see a bill on third-party testing for CDLs. Uh, this is something that could relieve some pressure that would allow residents to get their, you know, we're talking the 16-year-olds, the, the things like that that would really relieve that, uh, shift the businesses over so they can pay for the third-party testing, get that done. I've also heard from the Trucking Association, they're having the same issues. They need to get truck drivers trained, tested. Uh, we know what the workforce shortage is like right now and uh, trying to get those people tested through the process. Uh, we've, we've seen it in, in third-party bus testing. It works and it's been beneficial. So I just hope this legislative session, you open your uh, highlights to actually accepting that proposal, I think it's something that could alleviate some of this pressure, and then on the common resident in Minnesota uh, could see their time uh, reduced by trying to get theirs done. So thank you. All right. All right. I think Senator Jasinski might have had the last word, unless there's... All right. Uh, okay, so members, uh, we will uh, um, see you back here on Monday. We'll have at least one bill that has to do with... Um, uh, speaking of driver's licenses, has to do with translating uh, testing, um, and uh, and probably have a few others, but we'll we'll have we'll have notice out on those um, by tomorrow. Um, but uh, time is short, as we know. Um, deadlines are aggressive, so um, get your hearing requests in, and we will start running bills fast and furious very soon here. All right. Anything else, members? With that, we are adjourned.